Michael Cook, uh, Chief of the Public Information Officer at the U.S. Census Bureau. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's event entitled Plans for the Upcoming Releases of Income, Poverty, and Health Insurance Covered Estimates for Federal S Sources. I'd like to um, take a little time and talk to you about the program today. First, we'll have Tori Velkoff, the Chief of our Social, Economic, and Housing Statistics Division. Uh, she'll provide an overview of what was released last year. Um, then we'll have some subject matter experts walk you through um, exactly um, on the updates that we have planned uh, for the income, poverty, and health insurance coverage estimates releases that are forthcoming. We will open the floor for questions before we take a break at 1045, and then we'll come right back at 11 o'clock and continue with additional information before closing at 1140. I'd like to remind those that are online, uh, dialed in, listening and viewing today, that when you do dial in, uh, please uh, use the number 1-800-857-4620. The passcode is 9912525, and you need to stay on the line until the operator asks for the passcode. You do not press in the passcode. So without further delay, I'd like to welcome Victoria Velkoff, the Division Chief of the Social Economic and Housing Statistics Division here at the Census Bureau. Victoria? Thank you, Michael. Good morning, and thank you for joining us in the room and online. We're having this meeting today to explain our upcoming releases on income, poverty, and health insurance. We're going to be releasing a lot of important data related to income, poverty, and health insurance both this week and next month. And we want to be very clear about what we are releasing and when we are releasing it. I want to give you a little bit of background on the current population survey, Annual Social and Economic Supplement, or CPS ASEC as we call it. Last year, we implemented both redesigned income and redesigned health insurance questions in the CPS ASEC. How we implemented the new income questions and the new health insurance questions differed. For income, we used a split panel approach. In 2014, we had about 98,000 addresses in the CPS sample. We asked the new income questions of about 30,000 of those addresses. The remaining 68,000 received the traditional income questions. We needed the split panel design for income because it preserves a time series and provides a bridge between the old and the new series. The CPS ASEC is the source of the official U.S. poverty estimates, so a consistent time series is a necessity. And the best way to make improvements and create that bridge was to take a split panel approach. The time series for health insurance was also important, but knowing that there were other data sources out there, specifically the National Health Interview Survey and the American Community Survey, and knowing that we needed a very solid baseline for 2013 with the new health insurance questions, we decided to ask the redesigned health insurance questions of the full sample. We needed to establish a baseline in 2013 with the new health insurance questions. We wanted this baseline in place before the major effects of the Affordable Care Act took effect, and we can now use this 2013 baseline as a comparison with 2014 and future years. And only a full ASEC sample provides reliable estimates for small groups, some of which may be the most affected by the Affordable Care Act. I want to clarify before I go on the difference between the collection year and the reference year in the CPS ASEC. We collect the CPS ASEC in February, March, and April each year. The reference period for income, poverty, and health insurance coverage is the previous calendar year. So for example, the 2014 ASEC data referred to the 2013 income, poverty, and health insurance estimates. Likewise, the 2015 ASEC data refer to the 2014 income, poverty, and health insurance estimates. For the reports on income and poverty and health insurance that we released last September, we chose to use the sample based on the 68,000 addresses that received the traditional income questions. These are outlined in the red box. We did this for a couple of reasons. One reason is that income and health insurance are very closely related, so we wanted to have a consistent set of income questions for the health insurance report. Note that the sample is nationally representative. And for last year's health insurance report, we did not show change with the CPS data, but rather focused on calendar year 2013. 
we used ACS data to look at the change. So last year we put out three reports based on the sample that received the traditional income questions. Those were income and poverty 2013, health insurance coverage in the United States in 2013, and the supplemental poverty measure. We also put, up, put out some products based on the full ASEC sample. For example, we put out a table package on American families and a table package on geographic mobility. Note that these tables that were uh, based on the full sample did not show any income data. We also released several data sets last year. Last September, we released a public use file that was based on the 68,000 addresses that received the traditional income questions. Note that this data set was consistent with all of the reports we put out last year. We also released an extract on current health insurance coverage and a supplemental poverty research data file. In January, we released two data sets. One was the public use research file that was based on the sample that received the redesigned income questions. And we also released an extract that contained weights for the full file so that external users could combine the subsamples into one file. When we released the reports last year, we knew we needed to do a lot of research on the difference between the traditional income questions and the redesigned income questions. And we've done a lot of that research. We presented several papers at the American Economic Association meetings in January. We had an expert meeting here at the Census Bureau in March where we reviewed our research and received feedback from experts. We also presented several uh, papers at the joint statistical meetings in August, and we're planning to present a paper at the Federal Committee on Statistical Methods in December. With that as background, let me go through the agenda and tell you who will be talking about what. Ed Welneck, who is chief of the Income Statistics Branch, will discuss changes to the income questions in the CPS ASEC and compare the income results from the traditional and the redesigned questions. Trudy Wenwick, who is the chief of the Poverty Statistics Branch, will present information on the poverty rates from the two subsamples. She will also provide information about our releases on income and poverty. Marina Vornovitsky, Chief of the Health and Disability Statistics Branch, will give you an overview of the changes to the health insurance questions on the CPS ASEC, and she will provide information about our releases on health insurance. After Marina, I'll talk about some of our upcoming data releases, and we'll have some time for questions and discussions at that point. As Michael said, we'll take a break between 10.45 and 11, and after the break, we'll hear from Stephen Bloomberg from the National Center for Health Statistics. Stephen is the Associate Director for Science in the Division of Health Interview Statistics, and he will talk about some of the recent data from the Health Interview Survey. And then we'll have Alfred Gottschalk, the Assistant Division Chief for Small Area and Longitudinal Estimates here at the Census Bureau, and Al will talk about our Small Area Health Insurance Estimates for 2014. After Al, we'll have another opportunity for questions, and then we'll conclude the meeting. With that, I'll turn the podium over to Ed. Good morning, everybody. I am, as Bill Ed Welnick, Chief of the Income Statistics Branch, and I'm going to talk to you this morning about the current population for surveys 2014 Annual Social and Economic Supplement, or the ASEC, and the 2013 estimates we released last year. These are the topics I'm going to cover today. We're going to talk about the 2014 ASEC split panel design give an overview of the instrument changes we made in 2014. We're going to look at the source of last year's income estimates, and I'll finish talking about the research we conducted over the past year. Let's start with why we had the split panel in the 2014 ASEC. Census periodically conducts research to show how well our survey performs. This research usually involves looking at how the survey data compares to independent sources, usually administrative benchmarks. Our most recent evaluation looks at data collected back and compared to benchmarks to 2007. These evaluations have shown survey estimates consistently lower than our benchmarks. In 2011, the Census Bureau contracted Mathematica and Westat to further evaluate the performance of the ASEC questionnaire. 
Based on their research findings and a series of cognitive interviews to find ways to improve the data and the data collection, we conducted our first field test of the new income questions in March of 2013. That test used telephone interviews of retired ASEC sample of approximately 23,000 addresses. Based on the encouraging results from those, we saw amounts increase and the number of recipients increase. We decided to do a split panel, full production sample to further evaluate the redesign. The split panel approach subsampled addresses of the 2014 ASEC. About 30,000 addresses were randomly assigned to be eligible to receive the redesign questionnaire. The remaining sample of about 68,000 addresses were eligible to receive the traditional questionnaire. Let me list how the redesign differed from the traditional questionnaire. I'll go over each of these in more detail after going through the list. It used a dual pass approach for identifying income recipients and income amounts. That is, all information was collected about recipiency before any amount questions were asked. It used three tailored skip patterns. It used income range follow-ups for don't knows and refusals. It asked more questions about different property and retirement amounts and from other interest earning assets. It had new questions about retirement account withdrawals and distributions. And it had more detailed survivor, disability, and retirement questions. It also removed an income screener. The traditional ASEC asked households with less than $75,000 about means-tested transfer programs, such as food stamps and general assistance. There was evidence that the traditional questionnaire was inappropriately screening out some households that may be eligible for those programs. This could happen if there was a non-family member in the household that could be receiving those benefits, or if the family's current economic situation at the time of the interview didn't reflect their economics during the previous calendar year. The re redesign instrument now asks all households, regardless of income, all the transfer program questions. Let's take a look at these changes in more detail. The traditional questionnaire used an interleaf design where income receipt was immediately followed by amount questions. The redesign uses a dual pass approach. Here you can see how it worked with Social Security as an example. The first pass identifies all income sources received in the household. The second pass collects income amounts for each of the sources received. A tailored skip pass pattern used known characteristics of the household to ask more relevant questions earlier in the interview and to help reduce respondent fatigue and keep the questions relevant. The three skip patterns were for lower income households, which prioritize questions on means tested programs such as public assistance and food stamps. Here an income screener was used, but only to identify this as a lower income household. All the questions were still asked. Households, the second one was households with a member age 62 and over, which prioritized disability and retirement questions. And the third was the default, which was used if it was not a low income household or if there were no members 62 years old or over. It closely reflects the traditional incomes question order. All questions, again, regardless of household composition, were asked just in a different order. The redesign also used unfolding range follow-up questions anytime a respondent didn't know or refused to give an amount. The unfolding aspect was for respondents was initially selected if the lowest range was used, then a follow-up question was asked to further refine their income. The income amounts presented in the range questions depended on the source of the income. The redesign used a high, middle, and low ranges based on the type of income. This slide shows the sequence of range questions, again, using Social Security as an example. The objective of the income range question is to re reduce the amount of non-response by allowing res respondents to provide a less precise answer. To better capture retirement income, 
The redesign specifically asks about both traditional pensions, that is sometimes referred to as defined benefits, and retirement accounts, sometimes referred to as defined contributions, such as IRA, 401, or other accounts designed specifically for retirement savings. And it also asked about annuities. The traditional ASEC used one broad question that combined pension, retirement, and annuity income. If the respondent had a retirement account, the redesign asked the respondent to identify the specific types of retirement accounts and whether there were any withdrawals or distributions from those accounts. Questions on withdrawals and distributions from, the reti from retirement accounts were totally new in the redesign. There were no comparable questions in the traditional ASEC. The new questions asked an account type and it used that account type fill to use the exact wording the respondent gave for easier identification. For respondents over 70, the redesign question changed the text to reflect the fact that many would be required to take a distribution or a withdrawal. It would add the phrase, including distributions you may have been required to take. All withdrawals were followed up with questions asking if the money was rolled over or reinvested into another account which would then not be counted as income for that year. To better capture asset income, interest and dividend income received on retirement accounts was asked separately from non-retirement accounts. The questionnaire made no distinction, the traditional questionnaire made no distinction between investment income received in a retirement account and investment income received outside of retirement accounts. New also in the redesign, for people who refused or didn't know the amounts that they received in interest income or property income, were questions that asked the total value of the account at the end of the year. Interest earning checking accounts, savings accounts, money market funds, CDs, savings bonds, and shares of stocks in corporations or mutual funds are all types of non-retirement accounts. The redesign asked a series of questions specifically about each of these sources of income. Respondents with shares of stocks in corporations or mutual funds were asked follow-up questions about receiving the receipt of dividends or capital gains. No questions on capital gains were asked in the traditional ASEC. Capital gains are not included in the traditional definition of income nor in the income definition using the redesign. So these are the changes that the redesign in quest income questionnaire had. The 2014 ASEC gave us two samples and two sets of income and poverty estimates for calendar year 2013. So just to remind everyone what we released last year, all the 2013 and 2012 income and poverty estimates in last year's report were derived using the traditional income questions and the existing processing system designed for those income questions. This preserved continuity between the two years, a strictly apples to apples approach to comparing estimates and a consistent way to measure change between the two years. We will do something similar this year. However, we will be using the consistent redesign income questions and the existing processing system. Let me add that all of our estimates from all of the samples and subsamples were each based on weighted results to be nationally representative of the total U.S. population. Since the release of last year's report, we've been busy conducting research and evaluating the results from the split panel. A good part of analyst time over the past year was spent adapting the existing processing system to work with the redesigned questions. We have now completed that task and have also done some comparisons of income estimates der derived from the traditional questionnaire and estimates from the redesigned questionnaire. These next slides show what we found. This table shows the overall effect on median household income and the percentage difference between the redesign and traditional ASEC estimates by a few selected characteristics of households. All results shown are statistically significant at the 90% confidence level. 
Other characteristics we typically examined from year to year showed that none had statistically significant lower medians as a result of using the redesigned questions. This graph shows recipiency by source of income for people age 15 years and over. Here we show the number of income recipients by income source when using the traditional questionnaire, shown in green on the slide, and the number from the redesign, shown in purple, along with the percent difference. A goal of the redesign was to increase income, income source reporting using the dual pass approach of identifying all sources of income before asking amounts and using tailored skip patterns to ask more pertinent sources of income earlier in the interview based on household composition. With the exception of workers' compensation, all income recipiency was higher or not statistically different in the redesign. The increased recipiency of all these types of income resulted in some lower means by income source, but increased aggregates overall. Another goal of the redesign was to make the reporting of retirement income more current by adding new questions on retirement accounts. Here we see more retirement recipiency from both pensions and retirement accounts. Targeting retirement account income with expanded questions resulted in an over 400% increase in people that received those types of incomes from IRAs, KEOs, or other types of defined contribution plans. Using the same color scheme, here we see the changes in aggregate income by source. Aggregate income was higher in the redesign for all the same sources of income that hi had higher recipiency, except for dividends. One of the focuses of the redesign was to improve the reporting of means-tested income by removing the income screener, tailoring the income questions for low-income households, and using the dual-pass approach. Public assistance aggregate income was up nearly 30% in the redesign compared to the traditional questions. Aggregate interest income nearly doubled, actually more than doubled, and dividend income was slightly lower, 20% lower. This is likely a result of the redesign questionnaire better classifying what constitutes dividend income, separating interest or capital gains. Collectively, interest and dividend income was nearly 54% higher in the redesign. Here we can see what happened to income overall. Total aggregate income from all income sources was 4.2 higher in the redesign. Let me also add some perspective here with regard to income sources. While every income source is in fact important, we need to keep in mind that most income comes from earnings, that is from wages and salary or self-employment income. Earned income accounts for almost 76% of all the income collected in the ASEC. There was no change in the earnings questions in the redesign, and not surprising, there were no statistically significant differences between the traditional and redesign for recipiency or aggregate income earned, while the total for all other income sources combined increased almost 13%. As I just showed you, there were notable differences between the income estimates for each of the questionnaires. And keeping the estimates separate when making historical comparisons must be considered. However, in keeping them separate, sample size is reduced and sample, sampling variability increases. Some researchers have expressed concern about not having the full 2014 CPA, CPS ASEC available for their research. Our next speaker, Trudy Renwick, will talk about an attempt to create a combined income consistent file. Also, we have an online link to a research paper th that discusses that whole effort. So, to summarize, the redesigned ASEC showed increases in household medians, income recipiency, and income aggregates. The redesign questionnaire also seemed to improve the reporting for select targeted income sources, such as public assistance, retirement, and asset income. 
That concludes my presentation on income. Next, Trudy Renwick will talk about the impact the redesign had on poverty estimates and how we're preparing for this year's release. Trudy? Thanks, Ed. So I'm Trudy Renwick. I'm chief of the Poverty Statistics Branch here at Census Bureau. And I'm, um, as Ed said, I'm going to talk about two different things. I'm going to compare the 2013 poverty estimates from the sample with the traditional questions to the poverty estimates from the sample with the redesigned questions. And then I'm going to do a, do a little preview of what we are, a discussion of what we've been releasing yesterday and today um, and what we will be releasing on September 16th. So as Ed noted, as a result of the split panel in 2014, we have two sets of poverty estimates for 2013. The estimates from the traditional sample and the estimates from the redesigned sample. Um, last year, in our report, we compared 2012 poverty to 2013 poverty using the sample that received the traditional income questions. Um, on September 16th, we will be releasing our new 2014 poverty estimates and the comparisons in that report will be to 2013 estimates from the redesigned sample. So let's take a few minutes then to examine what are the differences uh, across these two samples. For the overall poverty rate, the official poverty estimate we released last September was 14.5%. If we use the sample with redesigned income questions, the overall poverty rate is 14.8%. The difference between these two poverty estimates is not statistically significant. You might note, though, that there is a higher standard error uh, with the estimate from the redesigned sample because that was a, that was a smaller sample. Um, besides the overall poverty rates, most differences in the poverty estimates um, be between the sample with the traditional income questions and the sample with the redesigned income questions were not statistically significant. There were a few ex exceptions. We found lower poverty rates for blacks and people who worked less than full time year round with the redesigned questions. And we found higher poverty rates for children, whites, Asians, and people in the Midwest with the redesigned questions. Let me just take a few minutes to go over some of these details. Um, in the next sequence of slides, I will show you the difference in poverty rates for the specific demographic subgroups. Um, I will focus on differences in poverty rates across the two samples, emphasizing the few that had statistically significant differences. The green bars show the poverty rates from the sample that received the traditional income questions and are the same as the rates that were published last September in our official income and poverty report. The purple bars show the rates for the samples that received the redesigned income questions, the rates that will be shown in our report next month for 2013. The poverty rate for children under the age of 18 was 21.5% in the sample with the redesigned income questions, 1.6 percentage points higher than the rate for children in the traditional sample. The difference for those aged 18 to 64 and the population aged 65 and older were, n were not statistically significant. Looking at poverty rates by sex, while women had a higher poverty rate than men in both samples, the differences across the two samples were not statistically significant. This slide looks at poverty rates by race. Here there were a few differences. Poverty rates were higher for whites and Asians in the redesigned sample, but two percentage points lower for blacks. Here we see poverty rates by nativity and citizenship. Across the two samples, the differences in poverty rates for these groups were not statistically significant. And in this slide, we're looking at poverty rates by region. The poverty rate for people living in the Midwest was one percentage point higher in the redesigned sample than from the traditional sample. For the other regions, the differences were not statistically significant. And here we're looking at poverty rates by place of residence. Again, uh, in this case, the differences across the samples were not statistically significant for any of these categories. This slide looks at poverty rates by disability status for people um, aged 18 to 64, and you can see that um, there were no significant differences here as well. And finally, looking at poverty rates by work experience, 
Um, here, the only significant difference were for people who worked less than full-time year-round. Their poverty rates were 1.7 percentage points lower in the redesigned sample than in the traditional sample. Since October 2011, the Census Bureau has been releasing an alternative national poverty estimate, the Supplemental Poverty Measure. Based on a series of suggestions from an interagency technical working group, the new measure creates a more complex statistical picture incorporating additional items such as tax payments, work expenses, medical out-of-pocket expenses, and the value of non-cash governmental assistance such as uh, SNAP benefits and housing assistance in the resource measure. The thresholds are estimated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and are derived from the Consumer Expenditure Survey and adjusted for geographic differences in the cost of housing. Last October, we released SPM estimates using the data from the sample drawn from the 68,000 addresses eligible to receive the traditional income questions. The overall SPM rate was 15.5%. Using the sample with the redesigned income questions, the overall SPM rate was 15.8%, not statistically different from the rate from the traditional sample. There were a few demographic groups that had significant differences. Um, like the official poverty rate, children under age 18 had a higher poverty, poverty rate. There were also, hi also higher poverty for owners with no mortgage people, uh, and lower poverty rates for people living in the West and those who worked less than full time year round. Should note that in addition to the redesigned income questions, there were also changes in the way that the Census Bureau collects and processes data on medical out-of-pocket expenditures. The estimate from the the SPM estimate from the traditional sample was based on the old processing system for medical out-of-pocket expenses. The estimate from the sample eligible for the redesigned income questions reflects a new processing system for medical out-of-pocket expenditures. Let me switch gears now a little and talk about what we've released yesterday and today. All of what we're releasing are estimates for 2013 from the 2014 uh, CPS ASEC. Yesterday, we put up a full set of detailed income and poverty tables with estimates for 2013 from the redesigned sample. You see here is a screenshot of our poverty table of contents, and you'll see that for every detailed table, there'll now be two choices for 2013 either the estimates from the traditional sample or the estimate from the redesigned sample. And the income detail tables will be similar, are similar to these. Um, today, I think, last we heard was at 10 a.m., they're going to be uh, releasing the 2014 CPS ASEC public use file for the sample that, re that was eligible to receive the redesigned income questions. Um, and uh, also today, we will be publishing the SPM research file for the redesigned sample for reference year 2013. Um, as, as Ed mentioned, um, we've, al the, we've also been busy doing research on what, how could we combine these files to create a full uh, 2014 CPS ASIC sample with consistent uh, income estimates. To do this, we've used statistical techniques to model values for three income sources, retirement income, interest, and dividends, in the sample that received the traditional income questions. We chose these three income sources because they were the sources with the largest differences between the two subsamples. When we ran the statistical model 10 times, and the file will include results of all 10 runs of the model so that researchers will be able to estimate the increased variance in the estimates due to these additional imputations. Um, as Ed noted, and you have the um, link from his slides, there's a working paper that was presented last month at the joint statistical meetings and, and posted on our website, which provides the details of this model that we ran and the results from this model. Um, that file should be posted in the next couple of weeks, and I've provided here the link of where you'll be able to find that file once once it, is, once it is posted, but it, it will not be posted today. And of course, September 16th is um, our day for our, our official release of the income, poverty, and health insurance reports. Um, we will be uh, releasing two income and poverty reports on September 16th. For the first time ever, we will be releasing the supplemental poverty measure on the same day as the official poverty measure. Um, the first report, Income and Poverty in the United States 2014, 
um, as we've mentioned before, will compare income and poverty estimates for 2014 to 2013 using 2013 estimates from the sample with the redesigned income questions. We also have two appendices in this report. One will compare income and poverty estimates from the traditional sample to income and poverty estimates from the redesigned sample, um, uh, extended version of what you've seen today in these slides. And we will also have an appendix that compares income and poverty estimates from the redesigned sample um, for 2013 to the income and poverty estimates from this com income consistent research file that uh, we'll be releasing in the, next, in the next few weeks. We hope that these tables will help analysts and researchers bridge the estimates across uh, the, the redesign of the CPS ASEC. And then the SPM report, which will, will for the first time will be issued on the same day, will also use the redesigned sample for its 2013 estimates, and we'll be comparing 2014 estimates to these 2013 estimates. So just to give you a little, this is what the tables will look like in the report. We blanked out the, I know a lot of you would like to see those 2014 numbers, but we blanked those out. But these 2013 numbers are the same as what we released yesterday in the detailed tables, and those will be the basis for our comparisons for all income and poverty estimates uh, in the September release. Our historical tables that will be released in September will, as we've done before, have two entries for, for 2013, one entry from the traditional sample and one entry from the redesigned sample, um, with appropriate footnotes um, explaining which is which. And of course, in September, we'll have, an, we'll have numbers for 2014 as well. Um, we also have online a web-based tool called Table Creator that folks can use to create their own custom tables. Using this tool, one can create single-year or multi-year averages for poverty, income, and health insurance estimates crossed by geography and crossed by a, a, a number of different demographic characteristics. On September 16th, we will release an update to the table creator, which will have a feature that will allow you to select among the three files for the, the, for the 2013 data. You'll be able to choose the traditional income questions, the redesigned income questions, or a combined file for health insurance estimates, which uh, Marina will, will, will discuss in a moment. Um, the tool will also have error messages so that it will warn users if they're trying to compare files that are not comparable. For example, if you try to create a two-year average between 2014 and 2013 using the 2013 estimates from the traditional sample, you'll get an error message saying that these two files are not consistent and should not be combine, combined, that you should be using the 2013 data from the redesigned if you want to do this two-year average. Um, so we're hoping that that will be useful to people who want to do tables beyond what, the, the tables that we publish. We will also be pre, uh, releasing the 2015 CPSA SEC public use file, uh, the, what we call the early version of that file, so it will not have taxes or non-cash benefits. Those will be released um, later. We also um, later will be releasing an SPM research file for the 2015 CPS ASEC, which will have SPM estimates for 2014. Um, but that will, will not be released on, on, on release day. I want to also talk a little bit about what we're not releasing on September 16th, just to give people um, a heads up. Traditionally, um, both income and poverty produce multi-year tables for state level estimates and for estimates by race and Hispanic origin. These tables will not be updated until next year when we have three years of consistent data. Um, we will, however, on sever September 17th, the day after, be releasing one-year ACS data, and that will provide single-year income and poverty estimates for states and for smaller racial groups. Just to recap, um, looking at the differences in poverty rates for the total population from the two samples, we did not find statistically significant differences. And even digging down into specific demographic and geographic groups, we found very few statistically significant differences uh, across the two subsamples. This week, we've released detailed tables for income and poverty for 2013 public use file using the redesigned sample for 2013 and the SPM research file. 
Coming soon will be the Income Consistent Research file. On September 16th, we'll be releasing both the official and the SPM poverty reports on the same day. And just to emphasize, the year-to-year -year comparisons in, that report, in those reports will use the sample with the redesigned questions for the 2013 estimates. Thank you. Here's my contact information if you have any more questions. And now I will turn it over to Marina to discuss uh, health insurance. Hello. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Marina Bornovitsky, and um, I'm the chief of the Health and Disability Statistics Branch. Uh, today, I'm going to give you a recap of what we released last year. I will also discuss the new CPS ASEC health insurance baseline and talk about what you can expect in the upcoming health insurance coverage report to be released in September. As you, ju as you just heard, last year, we made some changes to the income section of the CPS ASAC. These redesigned questions were administered to the entire, uh, uh, to a portion of the sample, while the rest of the sample received traditional income questions. Changes made to the health insurance section were different in both the scope and the purpose. In particular, last year we implemented a complete questionnaire redesign. This change was based on over a decade of research and was meant to correct known issues with health insurance coverage data. Also, we knew that we had to establish a very strong baseline for measuring changes between 2013 and 2014, when many major provisions of the Affordable Care Act were to go into effect. Having such a baseline was particularly important given the unique ability of the CPS to provide estimates of health insurance coverage for some of the smaller groups that are typically not measured with the same level of precision by other sources of health insurance coverage data. For these reasons, unlike the redesigned income questions, these new health insurance questions were administered to the entire CPS ASAC sample. This infographic further illustrates the importance of having a strong baseline in the CPS. As you may know, health insurance coverage data are collected by multiple surveys, some of which are listed here. However, the relative strength of the CPS is that it produces national level estimates for a wide range of demographic and economic characteristics. Very importantly, the CPS ASAC helps to view changes in health insurance coverage in relation to changes in the overall economic well-being of the nation. The change that we, um, hold on. So what were some of the issues with the CPS uh, health insurance coverage before the redesign? Here you can see both the, uh, the, the CPS and the ACS produce uninsured rates that track closely over time. The blue line is the CPS ASIC uninsured rate, and it represents the percentage of people who had no health insurance coverage at any point during the, the previous calendar year. The green line is the ACS uninsured rate, and it is a measure of the percentage of people who were uninsured at the time of the interview someone is more likely to be uninsured now than to have had no health insurance coverage at any time during the previous year. Therefore, one should see the green line above the blue line. However, the opposite is true here. The takeaway here is that the CPS produced estimates that were not in line with other sources of health insurance data. To address this and other issues, we implemented a new set of health insurance questions last year. The change that we made was not made lightly. This infographic details just some of the research and testing going back to 1998 that went into redesigning the questionnaire. Throughout, we followed a strict set of internal and external guidelines that ensure that any changes that we make 
are implemented thoughtfully and carefully in a transparent fashion and in full public view. So what makes these redesigned health insurance questions better? Well, the redesigned health insurance questionnaire begins the conversation about health insurance by asking respondents about their current coverage situation, and then uses the answers provided to obtain information on health insurance coverage during the previous calendar year. In terms of plan types, the instrument starts with general coverage questions first, and then drills down to specific plan types via different paths, depending on respondents' early answers. This makes it cognitively easier for respondents, resulting in more precise answers. The instrument also changed from a household level design to one that helps us capture health insurance coverage for all members of the household. We ask who else in the household had that plan type and ask about all household members by name to address gaps in health insurance coverage. The takeaway here is that the new questionnaire results in more precise measures of health insurance coverage, expands topic detail, and improves respondent experience. How well did these new questions work? From 2008 through 2012, you see the trend that I showed you before. However, in calendar year 2013, which was the first calendar year to reflect redesigned health insurance questionnaire, the CPS uninsured all year estimate was lower than the ACS currently uninsured estimate, as expected. So far, I have been talking about all the improvements that we made to the health insurance questionnaire last year. Let me switch gears now and remind you what we did about what we did in last year's release. In the spring of 2014, we implemented the new set of questions. So all respondents in the current population survey received the redesigned health insurance questionnaire. Then, last fall, uh, we released a report on health insurance coverage that was based on data collected using the redesigned health insurance questions. Last year was also uh, the, first, uh, the first year when redesigned income questions were introduced to a portion of the sample. The rest of the sample received traditional income questions. For consistency with income and poverty, last year's report on health insurance coverage in calendar year 2013 was based on the portion of the CPS ASIC sample that received traditional income questions. All estimates in the report were representative of the entire population of the United States. So how is this year going to be uh, different? Well, as I just explained, in calendar year 2013 and calendar year 2014, the entire CPS ASIC sample received redesigned health insurance questions. So this year, we are going to use the full sample for calendar year 2014 estimates, which is the red box on the right-hand side. Also, for comparisons to 2013, we are going to use the full sample for calendar year 2013 estimates. Using the, uh, the, uh, using the full sample for calendar year 2013 means that we have an even stronger baseline uh, for measuring changes in health insurance coverage due to the Affordable Care Act, especially for some of the smaller groups. For your convenience, we have recreated our 2013 uh, detailed tables using the full sample. These tables are available on our website. So what impact, if any, does using the full sample rather than a subsample have on the 2013 health insurance coverage estimates. As you can see, there is not much of an impact. The takeaway here is that the overall uninsured rate remains unchanged, whether you use the uh, subsample or whether you use uh, the full sample. Uh, the one issue is where we cross health insurance coverage uh, for calendar year 2013 by income or poverty. In this case, for our comparisons to 2013, 
we will use the subsample that received redesigned income questions in 2013. So what can you expect from the upcoming uh, release this September? In September, we are going to release the report based on CPS ASIC data that shows national level estimates for a wide range of demographic and economic characteristics. The report will present statistics on health insurance coverage uh, in the United States in 2014, and also focus on changes between 2013 and 2014. Here is an example of the type of information that you can expect to see. This table will show numbers, rates, and change between 2013 and 2014 by type of health insurance coverage. We are also going to continue to rely on the American Community Survey for state analysis. For example, this table will provide numbers, rates, and change in the uninsured rate by state between 2013 and 2014. Let me summarize our releases. We have produced new comparison tables for 2013 using the full sample. We will rely on estimates from these tables when we make comparisons over time. These tables, as well as tables that we released last year, are currently available on our website. In September, we are going to release a report that presents statistics on health insurance coverage in the United States in 2014 and focuses on changes between 2013 and 2014. We are also going to continue to rely on the American Community Survey for state analysis. Also released on September 16th will be a public use file, detailed and historical tables, and current health insurance coverage extract. Finally, data users who would like additional statistics will be able to create custom tabulations using the table creator tool that Trudy mentioned earlier this morning. This uh, concludes my presentation. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions about upcoming releases, feel free to contact me. Thank you. So you can see that we've been pretty busy and a lot's been going on. I'm going to do a recap of the session, this first session, and then quickly talk about the data products and that we'll be releasing and the schedule for that release. As Ed described, we made a lot of changes to the income questions in the CPS. The main changes are outlined on the left-hand slide of this chart. I'm not going to review them, but we did find that the changes had the result that we expected. That is, median income Median household income was the same or greater using the redesigned income questions. As Trudy explained, we saw very little difference in the poverty rates between the subsamples with the traditional and the redesigned income questions. This slide shows some of those results, and you can see that there was only a statistical difference for children. So for this year's income and poverty report that we'll be releasing in September, we will be showing two numbers for 2013. The first set of numbers will be based on the sample that received the traditional income questions. These are the numbers to use when looking back in time and are represented in the dark blue boxes in this chart. The second set of numbers for 2013 are based on the sample that received the redesigned income questions. These are indicated in the light purple. And these are the data to use when looking forward. Marina just went over the changes to the health insurance questions in the CPS in 2014. Note that the in these changes were implemented in the full sample. And again, the new question resulted in a lower percent uninsured, which is what we expected. As you've heard several times this morning, last year's health insurance report was based on the proportion of the sample that received the traditional income questions. We did this to be consistent with the income and poverty report. And the red box indicates that the proportion of the sample that we used. 
In this year's report, we'll compare 2014 health insurance coverage rates to 2013 health insurance coverage rates using different portions of last year's sample. For most of the characteristics in the report, the health insurance estimates will be compared to the full sample of about 98,000 addresses, as indicated in these two red boxes. Remember that last year, the full sample received the redesigned health insurance questions, so we would have a solid baseline for comparison with 2014. However, when we cross healthcare by income or poverty, we'll use the portion of the sample that received the redesigned income questions. So for most of the report, we'll be using the full sample for 2013, but when we look at health insurance by income and poverty, we'll be using the sample of approximately 30,000 addresses that received the redesigned income questions. Note that this sample is nationally representative. We have released or are about to release several additional products for income, poverty, and health insurance for 2013. The first is the material for this meeting, which is currently up on our website. We also released table packages for 2013 income and poverty using redesigned income questions based on the sample of 30,000 addresses. We released select 2013 health insurance coverage tables, most using the full sample. And we released a public use file with the redesigned income questions based on the sample of 30,000 addresses. We also have several upcoming releases. The first is on Wednesday, September 16th. We will release three reports on that day, income and poverty in the United States in 2014, health insurance coverage in the United States in 2014, and for the first time, the supplemental poverty measure in 2014, releasing that the first time on the same day as the official poverty measure. We'll also have a webcast at 10 o'clock that day where we'll go over the main results of these three reports. In addition, we will release detailed tables for income, poverty, and health insurance for 2014, we will also release a public use data file, and we'll release our measure of current health insurance coverage with the National Center for Health Statistics as we did last year. Then, the very next day on September 17th, we'll be releasing the American Community Survey's one-year data for the nation, states, and all geographic areas over 65,000. Finally, we will release uh, the income consistent research file based on the full sample and modeled income that Trudy talked about. We will also again be releasing table packages based on other topics such as families and migration based on the CPS. And as you'll hear later from Al this morning, we'll be releasing our small area health insurance estimates for 2014. As I said, on September 17th, we'll be releasing the ACS one year data products. This picture illustrates what you can expect to see in this release. With its much larger sample size, the ACS provides statistics for subnational geographies such as states, counties, metro areas, congressional districts, and cities. This level of geographic detail is not available from any other survey. For more information on income and poverty, you can go to our topic page on income and poverty, and this is a screenshot of that topic page. For more information on health insurance, you can go to our health topic page, and this is a screenshot of that page. Here's my contact information, um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Michael to moderate the questions. Thank you, Tori. And just a quick reminder, you can see it on the screen, the dial-in number, um, 1-800-857. 4620, passcode 991-2525. And also a quick reminder, um, before you state your question, if you could please mention your affiliation and your name. Operator, do we have any questions on the phone? And I'll ask also if we have any questions from those in the room. If you do, just raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. Or I'll ask you to speak into the microphone on the table so that the listeners on line can hear your question as well. Thank you. Oh. Um. This is for Marina. Uh, oh, I'm Sam Zalepko. I work at the Census Bureau. Um, 
I saw where the change in the question put the CPS more in line with the ACS, but I was just wondering if there was a quick reason for why the CPS question that should have yielded a lower insured rate than the ACS was giving a higher one. You are um, asking why the CPS estimate is lower than the ACS estimate? Um, in, the, in the plot with the blue and green line, mm -hmm. where the way the CPS question was asked mm -hmm. should have yielded a lower uninsured rate than ACS, but it was giving you a higher one. Is there a quick answer for what was going on there? or? So, so for why it should have been lower? Not why it should have been. Why, why it was higher? Did you figure out why it, why it was higher, even though it should have been lower? Uh, well, there were um, a number of um, uh, th there were a number of issues with the CPS um, ASAC health insurance questionnaire, and um, I can uh, direct you to some uh, to a lot of research papers that you know have been done over a decade, just uh, looking at some of the sources. So, in particular, we um, we may have missed some uh, household members when we asked about health insurance coverage, and that was one of the changes that we made. We started asking about household members by name to make sure that um, uh, we, um, to, to make sure that, uh, you know, if, if somebody was not mentioned, we followed up and asked, um, well, what about this person, essentially, to make sure that uh, we didn't miss anybody and um, that had an impact. Um, but I would certainly be happy to direct you to uh, research papers detailing some of the, some of the issues with the CPS ASIC redesign, okay. uh, with the CPS, CPS ASIC questionnaire. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And we have another question in the room? I'm Donald Lorich from HHS. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one is that uh, Trudy and others have mentioned that the SPM is going to be released the same day as the official, which I think is wonderful. Uh, thank you for getting that cooked up and out. Um, but the SPM does use the in-kind in taxes, but you said that that data will not be available on the microdata. When will it be available? Um, we don't have we don't have a specific date yet. We you know historically have put that data out in October, sometimes as late as December. Um, it'll certainly be sooner than that this year, but we don't have a specific date for you yet. You will have um, and and at the same time we'll put out that SPM research file so that you can also replicate the SPM estimates. But again, and uh, we prioritize getting the report out. At the same on the same day, and um, hopefully in future years we'll be able to put it all out on that day. Uh, Don Omar from HHS again. So this question is about the health insurance uh, redesign and uh, an update on where you are in the processing system in terms of releasing the full set of health insurance data that's being collected, mm -hmm. uh, rather than collapsing it back into the old category. Uh, well, we are certainly working on it um, as um, we hope to have more information um, after the September after the September release but you know it is certainly being uh, worked on the new instrument it is um, it is very uh, complex it uh, provides a lot more detail so we certainly want to make sure that we do a good job in terms of uh, providing quality statistics but it is being actively worked on and um, We'll share more information once we have it. Thank you. Any more questions in the room? And we'll check with the operator. Operator, any questions on the phone? We're running a little ahead of schedule. I know that we have mentioned it a number of times, um, and it should be ingrained into your, to your brains. Um, but I just wanted to take time to remind you yet again about some upcoming releases so that you can stay tuned for it and also to point you to 
um, things that are on our website that can be seen as resources. If you navigate to census.gov on our homepage, you'll see a slider um, at the top of the page. At that slider, um, there is an image directing you to today's webcast. Um, remind folks that are paying attention online that if you miss something, you'll be able to see the archived version of the webcast on our Ustream channel as well as on our Census Live page, as well as all of the documents, the background information um, that supports the information that's being shared today. So we'll check. Once again. You have a question from Daniello Treacy, Center on Budget Policy Priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the question for Trudy. Uh, given what you've learned uh, creating the income consistent file, would you say that kind of poverty estimates for 2014 are fairly comparable to 2012 and earlier despite the redesign in the income questions? Well, what we're suggesting to people is that they make comparisons with caution, that they, we're providing the comparisons between the traditional file and the redesigned file so people can see. As I noted, overall there were no differences. For many specific groups there were no differences, but if you, you should look and, and study those comparisons and use those to assess whether or not it's, it's, it's reasonable to make a comparison to earlier years or not. And, and can I do a follow up question? Sure. Um, you're, this year you will not be releasing kind of the three year SBM. It, the average, the, the SBM tables for states that use three years of SBM uh, data. So that will be next year. Will you advise users to not try to do that to create SBM estimates uh, for states? Well, we're not going to do it. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, and so I, I would say we're probably taking the more conservative tact and, and saying that we are not going to combine those files and do three-year estimates. We will be providing you with all the data that you need um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to, do a, to do a combined estimate, but also to look at the, the SPM estimates from the traditional sample and the SPM estimates from the redesigned sample. and. Mm -hmm. It look at it at, a, at the state level to see yeah. if there, how many states there are statistically significant differences and how many states there are not. And that could perhaps guide you as to whether or not it would be wise to, to do that three-year uh, average. Okay. Thank you. And our next question is from Pam Fessler from NPR News. Yeah, hi. Um, Trudy, um, actually, that's a good question. I'm pretty much answering questions. Yeah. How I mean, obviously, when we get the 2014 um, poverty number, people are going to want to compare it to like five years ago or 10 years ago. So when you say to do it with caution, um, are, are there certain qualifiers that you think we should use? Um, and also, I want to know, is that only at the national level or when you are or, or also talking about comparing poverty rates to some of the subgroups? Well, so we, as I showed you on the test, that there were statistically significant differences between uh, across the two samples for the national poverty rate. And so that would indicate that it would, you know, that making comparisons to earlier years for the overall national poverty rate is probably okay. We've done methodological changes in how we calculate poverty many times since 1959, and we continue to make comparisons. We've changed the thresholds. We've um, change some of our definitions of unrelated individuals. You can go through the footnotes on our historical tables if you want the gory details. Um, so um, I, I would say at the national level those comparisons um, are, are fine. It's when you get into smaller demographic subgroups that I would urge people to look at that appendix table and to see uh, whether it's okay or not to make those comparisons. Thank you. Thank you, operator. Are there any additional questions in the room? Go ahead. Hi, this is Joe Daliker, Congressional Research Service. Uh, my question is, uh, you've, um, you've done, you've, uh, with the redesign questions, you've been able to uh, do a better job of identifying sources of income, and yet I see that the poverty rates for certain groups have, act, have increased under the redesigned sample. Um, 
one would normally think that if um, you're discovering more sources of income that poverty would be lower. Do you have any additional uh, thoughts on how, what's sort of going on behind the scenes there? Um, well, I would direct you to look at a paper that my colleague Josh Mitchell and I presented at the American Economic Association in January, where we looked at that question. Um, short version of it is when we looked at the bottom quintile, the bottom 20% of the income distribution, we did not find the increases in income that Ed found at the median or Ed found in the aggregate numbers. So however the questionnaire was doing a better job of collecting income overall, for the total population, we did not see evidence of that in the bottom of the distribution. We, we also found some differences in sample composition across the two samples. As you know, most people may know, they're nationally representative, but those weights control for residence, for race, for sex, for age. Um, they do not control for all characteristics. And, and we actually found that the sample that received the redesigned income questions had three million more people living in single parent families than the sample that received the traditional questions. And so um, when we, di we did an analysis and found that that explained about half the difference in the child poverty rates. Uh, and we also found, looking at those earnings again, that earnings in the bottom 20% of the, of, the, of the income distribution were actually down. And those are, those are, that's a question that didn't change, but earnings were lower for the sample that got the redesign question than Thank the you. Operator, do we have any more questions on the phone? I'm showing no further questions, sir. And do we have any additional questions in the room? Well, we'll go ahead and take our 15-minute break and meet back uh, at 10.30. I'd like to thank everybody for their participation in the event thus far. <laughs>